Hi, this is Pat Sharp. I'm the clinic director at Neuroeducation, and this is a second in a series of little teaching videos on dyslexia. The first one was experiencing dyslexia, and you can look for that by that heading. Um, and it gave you an opportunity to feel what it's like to have a form of dyslexia uh, as you struggle through trying to read with the handicaps that they have in place. Today's teaching session is on how to assess which kind of dyslexia your child might have. So as I said, um, I'm the clinic director. It's Pat Sharp. Um, most people just call me Dr. Pat. Um, I've been in practice for 36 years, um, started neuroeducation back in 1978 and in Spokane, Washington. And we have a group of wonderful counselors and psychologists that offer assessment and treatment for all kinds of learning and behavioral challenges. And we also have a learning clinic. And these teaching seminars are pretty much uh, directed towards um, those services at the learning clinic because they deal specifically with the learning disabilities and the assessment of that. So just to refresh your memory, if you caught the first uh, teaching seminar I gave on experiencing dyslexia, I talked about two of them. The most common form is this dysphonetic kind, which typically means trouble with phonics or trouble with hooking up what the written letter is with its sound. And of course, in standard American English, we have some really wacko, crazy sound combinations that make phonics especially difficult. Matter of fact, it is the single most difficult language to read on the planet of all of the 300 odd active languages on our planet. Um, the second form uh, that you experienced in that experiential thing is a disidetic one. It's less common, but it's, it's pretty impairing. Uh, and basically, it's problems with more spatial kinds of processing of uh, critical features in words. So in this instance, you'd have a child who possibly could recognize a word on one line and three lines later, it's, they're completely baffled. It's like they never saw it before. And then the third and least common one and the least commonly um, diagnosed is referred to as surface dyslexia. And I think it's called that because on the surface, it doesn't look like they have a reading disability because um, they can bark at the print beautifully. I mean, they sound like they're reading, but much beyond a literal level of comprehension, they're not getting what they're reading. They're not understanding it at all. Um, they can even sound out nonsense words uh, because they're so good at the phonics part of it. And they pretty much exclusively read by phonics. So first, let's take a look at the dysphonetic type of dyslexia and sort of the miscue pattern that you might see in a child who has this more common form of dyslexia or reading disability. Uh, typically, they are either unable or certainly inadequate at associating sounds with letters that they see. And that's pretty consistent. They'll have them one day, they'll know the sound that the M makes, and they'll produce it beautifully, and a day or even two will go by and it's gone. They can't remember what it says, or they'll be coming up with a different sound for it. Maybe the N sound, uh, maybe a sound that looks like the letter they're looking at, but it's a different letter, a different sound. They can read familiar words very well, words they've seen over and over again, no pause, no hesitation at all. Um, and oftentimes they'll use semantic substitutions of words that look like the words they're reading, but it'll be a different word. Um, like, for example, they might see the word man, and they'll say non because the M looks like an N, and the small uh, letter A actually can look like an O, the, the, the kind of standard orthography A that you see in print. Um, uh, another example might be they see gleam and say beam because they're not picking up on the sound of those first two letters, and so they come up with a word that kind of globally looks like gleam because they're using their strength, their kind of spatial what's it look like kind of uh, ability to figure out what the word says. They'll also have a lot of trouble blending sounds together. Uh, they may be perfectly adequate at going p, a, t, and you'll think you got it, you got it, yeah that's it, say it. And what they say is something not right. They'll say tat or tap and you're like no, 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 no. Do it again. You had it. You had it right. 
but it's not coming together in their head. And that's not because they're not paying attention necessarily, that's because they can't blend the sequences of sounds in a efficient way, efficiently enough to figure out what it is they just sounded out. They'll also have trouble perceiving and processing the critical features of letters. So in our alphabet, uh, many of our letters share common features, like if they're seeing cat and they say something like oat, the O and the C in our language, in its written form, are very, very similar. There's only a tiny little half of a centimeter space, typically, between the closure on a C to make it into an O. Um, or they'll say was for mass where the W gets transposed uh, as an M. Those kind of things are very common. Uh, they'll also have a lot of trouble sequencing the sounds that they do get in the correct order. And the most typical one is the, you know, the saying was for saw or saw for was because it's, an, it's a sequential order problem there. And that's, that's, again, they're going for the global spatial way it looks, the blob, rather than the specific sequence of sounds that they're looking at, so letters. Some other beauties that I've experienced over the 36 years of the practice and, and working with people with learning disabilities, reading disabilities specifically, um, here's some beauties um, where the child was reading along and he said family, but the word was actually finally. And you can see that graphically those, those are pretty similar looking. Another beautiful one, this is an outstanding one, and they do this in a blink of an eye. It's not in, they don't even have to think about translating it. It's not translating it, it's just coming up with a word that matches the visual pattern they're looking at. Um, saying disturbing when the, when the word in the book was disrupting, and you can see that PB flip. And other than that, those words are pretty identical. Another fun one, a little slightly different on the meaning piece here, uh, was Trojan Heroes. Uh, but he read it as Trojan horses because he'd heard about Trojan horses or the Trojan horse. And so for his miscue, he came up with a word that leaned more on his understanding of the meaning of what was going on, but it looked like the word he was picking. Uh, heroes and horses look very similar. But again, it's a sequence thing. These guys definitely read better silently than they do orally. And sometimes you, you'll be surprised at how well they comprehend what they're reading when, if they're reading out loud, they're stumbling all over it, and you're thinking there's no way they're going to be able to answer any questions about this, and they surprise you because they can do that. Now, the second form of dyslexia, um, where I'm going to kind of lump these two together, um, the dysidetic, uh, and it's a much rarer form of reading disability, and in this case, because they can't do that automatic sort of recognition of a word as a whole unit. They are dependent forever on using phonics to sound out every single word all the time, which greatly slows them down, which greatly impacts their comprehension. And that's the similarity between dysidetic and surface dyslexia, because in surface dyslexia, it's a comprehension problem. They can figure out the text fine, but they don't get the meaning because they're just focused on the phonics. Um, so um, the, these are the kids who on one line will recognize the word, like they may have labored to figure out the pronunciation for, let's say, um, geography. And that word will show up again two lines later, and they're completely blank, except they know they should know the word, but they can't pull it up. They can't get it again without sounding it out, taking the time to sound it out. And that's because they don't get the visual graphic image. And by the way, all good readers move from learning how to read initially with phonics, and that's because it's the best way to learn our language. It is a phonetic language. But then somewhere around the end of second, beginning third grade, the shift really starts taking place where we're not using phonics so much anymore. You're just recognizing the words. You just look at the, 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 the black, you know, bits of data between the spaces and you just recognize them as whole words. And all good readers read that way instinctively. And we know this from brain scans, active brain scans, while people are reading, while mature good readers are reading. There's almost nothing going on over there in that area of the brain that hooks up sound with symbol, which is in the angular gyrus in the left hemisphere. It's almost all 
this more global spatial, you know, occipital parietal lobe kind of back of the brain stuff hooking up with language in the front, in the frontal lobes. Uh, and kind of bypassing the whole phonics things because it's not needed anymore. It's not needed to that extent. Um, these dysidetic kids are going to have a lot of trouble reading anything that's printed in um, a different form or is not phonetically sort of regular, um, like was or through. Now they can read short words better than long words um, because they're easier to sound out because that's the only way they can get to them. And they read better um, orally in terms of trying to hang on to the sound, you know, figure out what they've just read. In a more severe case of the dysidetic dyslexia, um, it, it kind of floods over into other areas besides just reading. And these are folks that won't appreciate whole spatial images of anything. Like, for example, recognizing photographs of people that they, they actually know um, and they'll be saying things like, well, who's that lady, mom, when the lady in the photo is actually their aunt, and they should know their aunt. They should recognize that that is their aunt, but they don't until you say, oh, that's Aunt Carol, and they'll say, oh, oh, yeah, right. Um, so those are kind of odd things that would strike you as odd and unusual, and they are, but it's all, it's all kind of combined in that same processing part of the brain that's not picking up on spatial images. So in surface dyslexia, to be more specific, um, they have just a very significant difficulty with comprehension much beyond a basic literal level. So they can read a text, and if it says in the text that the man with the brown hat on left in a hurry, slamming the door behind him, and you asked what color was the man's hat, they could answer that. But if you asked him a more kind of interpretive question, like, why do you think um, he was in a hurry? Or why do you think he slammed the door behind him? Um, they can't do that kind of comprehension. They can't read between the lines, as it were. Um, so they bark at the print extremely well, but they don't understand the concepts. And so they don't look like they have a reading disability. Matter of fact, they don't even think they have a reading disability. And if it gets picked up at all, it doesn't get picked up until well through, you know, those upper grades, somewhere around 8th, ninth, 10th grade even. Sometimes even as adults, it doesn't get diagnosed until they realize, this isn't right, you know, I, I should be able to get this. Other people can read a book and remember what they've just read, and I can't do that, even though I can, I can read all the words just fine. So the final summary of this thing is that, you know, we're not cookie cutters, and we don't have Many of us don't have very specific, isolated sort of kinds of dyslexia. More typical is this mixture of everything. And what you're going to see there is there'll be no one specific pattern of miscues, but there'll be a lot of miscues, and they'll kind of cross the borders so that there's kind of general weaknesses in several places, several weak links, which combine together make remediation very, very um, uh effortful because they don't really have any huge strong strengths to lean on to learn how to decode. So what comes next? Well, um, one thing I want you to take away from this is that you absolutely cannot learn a new complicated skill like reading, which is the most single complicated skill that human beings learn how to do and have to be taught how to do. You can't do that through your weaknesses. You have to do it through your strengths. So our next session is going to be on, okay, so say I've determined it's this kind of reading problem my child has now. What do I do about it? How do I remediate it? So the name of that session is Remediating Different Forms of Dyslexia. And uh, you can uh, look for it by that name. You can maybe hunt for it uh, with the, the name of the corporation, Neuroeducation. Or you can call us and ask. Okay? Thanks so much for listening in. Bye.